Hi. So when I was invited here, I was told to talk about some amazing thing that the body uh, can do. But I actually want to start by talking about something that the body cannot do. So I spent the last three years researching a book about the genetic basis of athletic performance. And one thing that I thought uh, was genetically based was the ability to hit a baseball. But actually, it turns out uh, that uh, re the human reflexes are not fast enough to intercept a 100 mile per hour speeding object. It actually takes one fifth of a second for you to just see that there's a ball in view and to initiate muscular action. And that is half the flight time of a baseball. And so I want to use a little story to demonstrate, to, to prove to you this is true. So this is, this is Barry Bonds, you might know as one of the greatest baseball players of all time at the 2003 Major League Baseball All-Star Game. And he has his arm here around Jenny Finch, who was one of the best softball pitchers in the world at the time. Barry spotted her sort of through a crowd. And so he walked up to her and started sort of, you know, unfurled his peacock feathers and sort of started flirting, which for Barry means telling her that if she pitched to him, he would hit her in the face with the ball because he would hit it so hard back at her. That's Barry Bonds' sort of version of flirting. Uh, <laughs> works every time. You should try it. And so, so you can see Jenny here looking very skeptical. And Jenny said, you know what? Why don't, I'll, come and, and I'll come and pitch to you. How about that? And Barry said, oh, yeah, bring a cameraman. I want the whole world to see it. You know, bring a net because it's going to be dangerous and I'm going to hit you. So Barry, Jen, Jenny pitches about mid-60 miles per hour from 43 feet away, which is the exact same transit time that Barry is used to facing in the major leagues. So Jenny went out to visit him and started to pitch to him and brought the cameraman that he requested. And after about three pitches, this is what the cameraman got because Barry missed so badly on those pitches that the, he told the cameraman he couldn't film anymore. And so he just looked down at his feet. What, what Barry didn't realize was that Barry Bonds' reflexes are not fast enough to hit a baseball. No human beings are. All baseball players, doctors, teachers, lawyers, a fifth of a second is the average. Baseball players are no faster than anyone else. And we simply don't have a visual system that's capable of tracking a baseball as, as it, the angular position gets close to your face. It's moving too fast. The advice to keep your eye on the ball is nonsense. You can't do it. You could close your eyes when the ball's halfway in if it weren't psychologically upsetting. <laughs> what, what Barry didn't realize, oh, that wasn't even a joke. The, um, what, what, what Barry didn't realize was that his ability to hit the ball was not based on his superior reflexes. It's actually based on learned perceptual expertise. It's based on, on cues from the pitcher's body that he has picked up and encoded in his brain through hours and hours and hours of practice. The rotation of the pitcher's shoulder and hip, the flicker of the ball, which is the flashing pattern the seams of the ball make when it rotates, and he had not practiced against a softball pitcher with a different shoulder rotation and with, with a different spin of the ball. So he was left relying on his reflexes, and he simply could not do it because he had not... Jenny Finch then toured the country doing this to other baseball players. So it, it turned into a show, a television show. So he couldn't do it because he hadn't put in the right practice. He hadn't put in his 10,000 hours of practice. So you've probably heard... Have you heard of the 10,000 hour rule? Raise your hand if you've heard of the 10,000 hour rule. Okay, pretty much everybody. This is the idea that what looks like talent, what looks like Barry Bonds' fast reflexes, is actually accumulated hours of expertise, where he's learned what's called chunking. He has subconsciously learned arrangements of body positions that allow him to anticipate what's coming in the future and to not rely on his reflexes. And we all use chunking as, as a method to grapple with large data sets very quickly and things that we are expert at. So I'm going to show you something that we are all expert at here, the English language. I'm going to give you uh, a slide with 20 words, and I'm going to give you 10 seconds, and I want you to memorize as many as you can. Ready? Oh, was that up already? Oh, okay. Okay, did you remember all those? Maybe five, maybe 10, maybe if somebody's a memory expert, they did. I'm, now I'm gonna give you another slide with 20 English words and I want you to try again and see if you do better this time, ready? Did you do better that time? Did you remember more words? As you might have guessed, those were the exact same 20 words. Right? But you have learned systems of grammar. You've put your 10,000 hours in for learning the English language. You've learned systems of grammar and groups of words, the same way that Barry Bonds has learned arrangements of body patterns that allow you to grapple with large data sets very, very quickly and intuitively. So maybe uh, if you put in your 10,000 hours of looking at baseball pitchers, you too could be Barry Bonds. Right? You didn't realize that this was what you were doing with the English language. So maybe we could all be uh, major league baseball players. 
the thing is, while, while you've all heard of the 10,000 hour rule, you probably don't actually know that it comes from a study of a tiny group of violinists who were so highly pre-screened they had already gained entrance to a world famous music academy. Right? This would be like taking NBA centers, noticing they'd all practiced a lot, and saying that's what got them to where they are. And the man who actually did the study, the, the so-called father of the 10,000 hours rules, a psychologist named Anders Ericsson at Florida State, and he's been so dismayed by the treatment of his work by the journalists, that he that by journalists in general that he now has a letter on his faculty webpage titled this, which I think is pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> so, and one of the reasons that he's so upset is because the 10,000 hours was an average of individual differences. So chess masters do the same thing that you do with English words and the same thing that Barry Bonds does with body positions. They, gr they learn chunks of pieces that allow them uh, to interpret things very quickly. And so the, the average number of hours, for example, to chess international master status in chess is 11,053 hours of practice. But some people make it in 3,000 hours. And some people are at 25,000 hours and counting and still haven't made it. So the problem is the 10,000 hours was an average of individual differences. It was this rule that was meant to say genes don't matter to expertise. But the reality, a more honest rule would be something like this. The 10,000 hours plus or minus 10,000 hours rule. Because that's really the only thing that shows up in development of skill acquisition is tremendous individual range. So genes do matter. So I'm, I'm sorry to tell you that you, if you did spend 10,000 hours looking at pitchers, you would get better at baseball, but you might be missing certain physical hardware that will allow you to be Barry Bonds, as an example. There are, the, the average Major League Baseball hitter has visual acuity of 2012, meaning they can see from 20 feet away what I have to stand at 12 feet away to see, okay? Not the Cubs, but most Major League hitters. <laughs> so if, I'm from Chicago, I can say that. And so pay really close attention to this, right? Do you see that? Can, you see, can everybody read that? Because if you can, the Cubs have a position for you in center field, and you should go there right now. Uh, so genes actually do matter in sports. So once people learn the skill, visual hardware, like this visual acuity, which is based on the density of photoreceptors in your eye, which is like the megapixel rating of a camera, becomes very important because it allows you to pick up visual cues uh, long, earlier than the next guy, basically. So, Sports genes actually do matter, and they matter in some very visible ways. So let's start with an obvious one. You don't have to pay too much attention to this, but this is some data analysis I did for my book. This blue curve is, is the height distribution of men ages 20 to 40 in the United States. The red curve is the height distribution of men in the NBA. And granted, we all know intuitively there's not a lot of overlap, but there's so little overlap that if you know an American man who's between the ages, ages of 20 and 40, who's at least seven feet tall, there's a 17% chance he's in the NBA right now. That's how rare that is. And, and not only are NBA players incredibly tall, they are really, really long. So this is what you might recognize, this, this is Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian man, the canon of proportion, right? The arms equal to the height. I'm, I'm about one to one. Average is actually about 1.01 to one. So you should be slightly longer. But the, the Vitruvian NBA center would never fit in a circle and square. The average NBA player is six foot six and three quarters with seven foot long arm span. So not only are they ridiculously tall, but they are ludicrously long. <laughs> so that's sort of an obvious, some obvious ways uh, that sports genes matter. Here's another one. In, in the reporting of my book, I went to visit this man. I hope, he, I hope he looks very red to you on the screen. So most people in Arctic Finland don't look this red. They're very white. Uh, his name is Eero Manturanta. He was maybe the best endurance athlete in the world in the 1960s. He won seven Olympic medals as a cross-country skier. And the reason his skin is so red is because 20 years after his retirement, it was found that he has a rare gene mutation that causes his body to overproduce red blood cells. And now in his old age, his skin is turning red, and he has to take blood thinners. So he was naturally what Lance Armstrong was with technology, basically. <laughs> uh, so this is, now you can see it on his skin. And literally, he was. He just overproduces red blood cells. Here's, here's another obvious way. Oh, puppy, look at it. Look at those traps, though. That's not cute. That thing is, look at it. This, this is a dog with a mutation, a, a mutation in its myostatin gene, which is a gene that regulates muscle growth. And breeders f that want racing whippets breed for this gene. This one has two copies, and they're actually too big um, to race, so they actually get put down a lot, unfortunately. Um, and this is what happens when cattle have that same mutation. And this is what happens when babies have the mutation. This is a newborn. Look at that butt. You can bounce a quarter off that butt. This, <laughs> this, baby, this baby could hold six and a half pound dumbbells at arm's length when, when he was three. 
right? If you have a three-year-old, you know that's, imagine toddler proofing that household. <laughs> okay, sports genes also work in some less visible ways, okay? And I want to talk about those, and I want to use a really handsome guy to demonstrate it. That's me in the light blue there, a handsome <laughs> devil. Back when my lower to upper body weight ratio was much more favorable. Um, and this is my training partner, Scott, who's a Canadian national athlete. And I was a walk-on to running track in college, which means I wasn't recruited. Scott was very highly recruited. And we were put together to train. And what would happen was, at the beginning of every season, he would be in great shape, even though we hadn't done any training. And I would be in terrible shape. But we would do the same training, stride for stride, day after day. And I would catch up on him and surpass him. And the coaches would tell me, I'm so tough. I don't have any talent, I'm just really tough. And they would, they would give him psychological counseling. They were like, you know, you just have to stay calm. But we were doing the same training. So what I now, it actually was a really favorable narrative for me though. I won this award for the four-year athlete to achieve significant athletic success in the face of unusual challenge and difficulty, right? <laughs> the, the unusual challenge and difficulty just being that I stunk at first. So, but, and so, yeah, I thought, that, yeah, I'm just really tough. But then I started, you know, I'm doing the same thing as this guy. We live together, we eat together, we train together. And then when the reporting of my book, I came across the most famous exercise genetic study ever done. So this, this, you don't have to pay too close attention to the numbers, but this is the, called the Heritage Family Study. It took 98 two-generation families, put them on identical five-month cycling trains, identical. They had no training history. And this is a measure of how much their ability to use oxygen improved. That's a really great measure of your endurance. And you can see the people on the left improved uh, either not at all, a small group of people, or even got worse. Most people are in the middle, they moderate improvement. And there's a small group of people who improved like crazy. In 2011, these researchers found a 21 gene set. In, in this group, people who had 19 or more of the favorable versions of the gene improved their oxygen carrying capacity three times more than people who had fewer than 10. I was tested in reporting my book, it just so happens I have a bunch of them. And now look at what happened with me and Scott in a much more different light. My talent was trainability with a certain uh, training program. So it's kind of a non-obvious way that sports genes work. Another non-obvious way is with the brain. So there are, there are scientists who breed animals for the compulsive drive to train, to be physically active. In just a few generations, if you separate mice that uh, run voluntarily a lot and those that, run that don't run voluntarily much and breed them with each other, you'll get these incredible couch potatoes and these manic, absolutely junky runners. Like, they're literally junkies because they, they exhibit the same behavior that other mice do. They're trained to, like, crave cocaine, but they need to run instead. And some of these genes we are now studying in humans, um, like Pam Reed. This is a, Pam Reed is a legendary ultramarathon runner. This is a picture of her running one of 491 straight laps around a one-mile park in Queens. And it's not even a picturesque lap. She was one of my favorite interviews in the book because the day I interviewed her, the previous day she had run the Ironman uh, Triathlon National Championships in New York. Uh, she qualified for Worlds. And the next day her flight out of LaGuardia was delayed because every flight out of LaGuardia is delayed. And she gets so uncomfortable sitting still that she stashed her bags in a corner and was running laps around the parking structure while I was interviewing her. So Pam actually really keeps up with the mouse uh, dopamine genes literature because she wants to like, learn about herself. So these are some of the non-obvious ways uh, that genes affect our athleticism uh, that I came across in the reporting of my book. So maybe now you might be asking yourself a little bit, what, about, what are my sports genes? Who, who am I? And that's, that's kind of the question I want to leave people with here. So for me, I didn't know who I was as an athlete until I found the right environment for my genome. Just as medical genetics has ushered in a sort of revolution where we know that because of differences in your gene involved in acetaminophen metabolism from my gene involved in acetaminophen metabolism, my one Tylenol might be more or less effective than yours, the same thing is holding true in exercise genetics. No two people respond to any training the same way. I think this is one reason why exercise fads go in and out, because there's no cookie-cutter plan that can be used for every person. So if, if, you're, if you are undergoing a training program and notice that your training partner is having much better results than you are, the problem may be you in the very deepest sense of the word. So instead of just sticking to it, you should try something else. And, and I want to leave you with this quote from a man named J.M. Tanner, who was the world's expert in body growth and development and also a world-class hurdler. Everyone has a different genotype. Therefore, for optimal development, everyone should have a different environment. Your genome is totally unique in the world, so you really don't know who you are as a physical specimen, as an athlete, unless you're Bionic Bertolt, in which case maybe you do know, but you don't know who you are until you find the right environment for you. So most of you won't get 
the genetic testing and the physiological testing that I got for the reporting of my book, but you should at least take a trial and error mindset to your training. If you're not keeping an eye toward finding out what is the best, what environment, what training environment is the best fit for your genome, you're really not trying to get everything out of yourself uh, and, and out of your body. Uh, and so I would just, just remember that training, undertaking a training plan is a form of biological self-exploration that is far beyond what even cutting edge science can tell you about yourself right now. And with that, I'd just like to wish everybody happy training.